some technical issues, but we hopefully have got them sorted out, and we have our speaker on the phone. Hopefully, Chris, you can hear us. Um, and um, I'm George Yorling. I'm Director of Medical and Scientific Affairs here at HDSA, and I want to welcome you to our latest installment of our research webinar series. Uh, this month, I'm excited to have Dr. Chris Ross from Johns Hopkins, who will be uh, presenting to us on the results of a recent uh, clinical study that was completed in Huntington's disease patients. Before I do that, I just for those new to the research webinar platform, I just want to um, give you a little bit of information about how these work. Uh, you're all muted, uh, but you can ask questions at any time during the presentation, just simply by going to the uh, questions box, which I've highlighted here in red. Uh, type your question and click send, and uh, we'll be reading these to Dr. Ross at the end of his presentation. If you know others that, uh, or if you have to dart out, um, or you know others that would be interested in hearing uh, this presentation, we are recording this, and it'll be available on our website uh, to watch at your leisure or convenience uh, within a week of today. And they're all found on, on our research tabs on, in, under research webinars. And just finally, uh, there's a couple exciting talks that I'm, I'm working on for the future in September and October. In September 26, our speaker will be Dr. Ken Merrick from uh, the Institute for Neurodegenerative Disorders, and he'll be speaking on uh, PDE-10 imaging in HD patients. PDE-10 is a, a, a hot target and, and that you'll be hearing a lot about um, as, as drug developers are looking to design inhibitors of this enzyme uh, for Huntington's disease and other diseases. And in October, uh, late October, just finalizing the date, we'll have Dr. Philip Gregory, who's the Vice President of Sangamo Biosciences, speaking on zinc finger proteases, or Z CFPs, uh, as a novel new treatment uh, for Huntington's disease. So we're excited about that. So stay tuned. You'll be getting emails on that. Uh, and, and as always, if you have any updates or, or, or ideas for topics you'd like to hear more about, email us at researchupdates at hdsa.org, and we will do our best to uh, find a speaker to address that topic. All right, so let me introduce our speaker. I'm, I'm very excited to have Dr. Chris Ross uh, joining us today from Johns Hopkins. Dr. Ross is a professor of psychiatry, neurology, and neuroscience. Uh, he's also the director of the Division of Neurobiology, the director of the Molecular Neurobiology Laboratory, and the director of the HDSA Center of Excellence at Johns Hopkins University. And on top of that, he's a former Coalition for the Cure investigator for HDSA. Uh, Dr. Ross received his bachelor's degree from Princeton University and his MD and PhD from Cornell Medical School, or Medical College. Uh, Dr. Ross has been, is, is a leader in the HD community and research field, and uh, in, in addition to working in HD, his interest in Parkinson's disease as well as other uh, diseases such as schizophrenia, where he uses a wide array of uh, different technologies uh, biochemical as well as different animal models to identify new targets and uh, potential drugs for Huntington's disease. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Ross. And Chris, we're going to make you the presenter, so we, everyone should be able to see your screen. Can you hear us? Chris? Chris? Chris, are you there? Oh, we see your screen. But we can't hear you, Chris.
Hello? Hey, yeah, Chris. Okay. I was getting a lot of feedback. I'm now hearing an echo. Are you guys well, we'll go echo? mute. Hopefully that's part of, that's part of it. So we're going to go mute, and we're going to turn it over to you, and you can just go ahead and, and show your presentation from your screen. Okay, great. Uh, let's see, does everyone see this? Maybe yes, we see it. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to discuss the use of um, pre-manifest subjects in clinical trials. I'm getting a, a terrible echo. Is it, everyone else hearing that? I guess there's no way to know. Well, I'm hoping we're, people are hearing I'm me. not hearing anything here in, in the New York office. You sound fine coming through to us. OK. Uh, let me I don't know if you have like a cell phone or something close, a microphone or an iPad, maybe. Is that better? Still echoing uh, today. It sounds worse. OK. <laughs> How about now? That sounds good. Let me see if I can not put the headphone near me. How's that? It still sounds good. OK, so um, if I don't come in well, um, see if you can yell and let me know. Because what I've done is I've put the earpiece away from my ear, but I've got the microphone near me. And I'm hoping that that's coming through OK. Is that working? You sound fine here, Chris. OK, great. OK, so let me go ahead then. So I'm going to talk about um, clinical trials and pre-manifest HD. Um, I'll talk actually fairly briefly about the prequel study um, and spend more time on uh, general uh, HD topics. Now let me see if I can advance the slides. Uh, there we go. OK. So um, as I said, I'll, I'll talk about uh, some general topics about pre-manifest HD, the use of biomarkers. Um, briefly go over the prequel results, which was really a feasibility trial, and then talk about um, some ideas about future therapeutic trials. I'm sorry we're starting late. I'll try and go through this quickly, because I really want to leave time for questions, because I think that's very important. And if there are any slides that I go over too quickly, um, please uh, ask about them, and I can go back to them. I have no conflicts of interest. I receive uh, funding from the NIH and from foundations and, um, of course, the Center of Excellence for the um, uh, Clinical Center. So just to review briefly the um, aspects of HD that are, are relevant to the talk, as we know, it's a, it's a brain disease. This is a um, normal, a, a half brain from a normal subject, and this is a half brain from an HD subject. And you can see the huge shrinkage of the caudate nucleus here versus here, and containment here versus here. And these are the areas that are, are especially affected. There's also quite a bit of change in the cortex, but that tends to be relatively late. And as we all know, HD is caused by an expansion of a CAG triplet repeat in the Huntington gene and protein. And that enables us to make rough predictions as to the age of onset um, of the disease in someone who ha has been tested for the gene and its mutation, but does not yet have symptoms. And that's because there's a threshold for getting HD. And as you can see, above 36 repeats, there people begin to have an age of onset. That is, people begin to be affected by HD. And then the longer the triplet repeat, the earlier the age of onset. And you can see this is the log scale, so that we're starting in the low repeat expansions in the 40s with onsets in adult life or even sometimes quite late in adult life. And then as we get the rare cases with long expansions, we have very young onset in the teens or even tragically in, in children. So this allows us to predict approximately what the age of onset will be. But you can see there's a lot of variability, particularly for the adult onset cases where prediction is, is most relevant. Now this slide has a lot of of information, and um, I'll go through it uh, point by point. I, I think it, it, it summarizes a lot of what we know about the natural history of HD. This is a, a, a sketch I made myself 
but it takes into account um, data from the PREDICT HD study, the CRAC HD study, the registry study, um, as well as our own extensive experience with HD at Hopkins. And uh, here's my pointer again. Um, so this shows a prototypical case of HD with age of onset around 45. That's, That's the mean, mean age of onset, or approximately the mean age of onset. And then you can see that before the, the individual has onset, they begin to have changes in a number of different realms. And those changes, uh, I particularly am highlighting the motor changes and the cognitive changes. Sorry, I don't know why my pointer keeps going away. But um, what I'm showing is the progression of symptoms over the course of a prototypical individual with HD. And you can see that what begins early on, even before we can make the diagnosis, are some subtle motor changes and some subtle cognitive changes. And those continue to get worse. Interestingly, the chorea, which is an early symptom, an early sign, I should say, tends to plateau. And what gets worse and worse with time is what we call motor impairment, or bradykinesia, rigidity, um, sorry for using medical terms, slow movements, um, rigid um, uh, appearance, and incoordination. And that's what tends to affect people very late in the course of the illness and when they have swallowing problems and eventually um, uh, succumb to HD. And what's striking is that what we found is that, as I think everyone who's familiar with HD knows, it, there's no single point when the disease is clearly present. We make the diagnosis simply when there's, there are enough signs and symptoms that we can say with 99% confidence, this is what HD looks like. But there are typically signs and symptoms over the course of many years prior to that. And it's at that point that you begin to see <coughs> functional changes. Functional meaning just uh, problems at work, problems with social interactions. And we generally don't make the diagnosis of a disease until there is some functional effect of the disease. And then that continues to progress as the um, motor and cognitive signs progress. I should mention that the psychiatric features, which can be very important, are less predictable in when they occur and how they progress. And, and that's the only reason why they're not shown here. Now, if you look at this kind of diagram and look at imaging, you can see really striking changes quite early on. So this is just to highlight how we, how we do imaging studies. This is from one of our early studies at Hopkins when we were outlining the caudate nucleus by hand. And that was how we started doing these studies. Now everything, of course, is automatic. And it's done in hundreds of individuals, for instance, in the PREDICT and, and TRAC HD study. But what you can see is that even before people have a diagnosable onset of HD, they begin to have atrophy of the striatum, that nucleus that I pointed out as being most affected in, in the brain um, in, in that early slide. So this shows a graph of people who have been tested for the HD expansion but don't yet have HD. And this actually shows, based on the CAG repeat length and their current age, how many years it is before their predicted onset. So their predicted onset would be here. And these are people who are five years away from the predicted onset, 10 years, 15, 20 years from the predicted onset. And then for comparison control individuals who really shouldn't be on this axis but are here just for comparison. And what this shows is the volume of that area of the brain that I pointed out before, the striatum, particularly the caudate nucleus. And these are a, a bunch of individuals in the PREDICT HD study who are either predicted to be far from onset predicted to be midway to onset, about 10 to 15 years from onset, or predicted to be relatively close to onset, around 5 to 10 years from onset. And then you, you can see that for each of those groups, at the beginning of the study, the volume of the caudate nucleus is smaller than controls. And this is a longitudinal study. So that each point, each um, line, rather, connects two points two years apart. This is the first scan. This is the second scan for all the same for all these groups. This is the first scan. This is the second scan. And you can see that over the course of two years, every single one of these groups had decreased in the volume of the striatum. So there's really a striking decrease in the volume of the striatum. Even before the diagnosis can be made, there's loss of about 50% of, of the volume of the striatum. And that's just shown schematically here. This is the same kind of graph as what I showed before with the um, 
uh, typical onset of age 45. And what you can see is that the striatum has already begun to atrophy, and individuals have already lost a substantial amount of the volume of this important brain nucleus at the point we make the diagnosis. This also shows that there are other areas of the brain that atrophy. In this case, just the cortex is shown, but there are many other areas that would look similar. And they also atrophy, but the striatum starts earliest and goes most um, severely. OK, so that is the introduction about how we can test for the HD expansion, know approximately when someone is going to get it, um, and even know using these imaging techniques what's happening in the brain and, and when the atrophy begins and how it's progressing, even before we're at a point where we can make the diagnosis. So the prequel study is, I would call it kind of a preliminary or a pilot study to give us experience in how to do clinical trials in individuals who've been tested and are so-called pre-manifest, that is, just like these other individuals I've been talking about, they have been tested positive, but they don't yet have diagnosable signs and symptoms. And all we were doing in this study was essentially, as I said, a feasibility. We were testing the tolerability of a commonly used drug in, in clinical trials in HD, coenzyme CoQ. And I'll um, say more about that in a second. So just to, to go over the um, design of the study, we had 90 individuals who were enrolled in the study. And I want to highlight that this was a multi-center study. So this really mimics the way clinical trials are done these days. You need large numbers of subjects to get significant results. So you need to have many centers participating. In this study, we, we started out with 10, and we added three more. Everybody was so-called pre-manifest, simply meaning they were positive for the HD expansion, but did not yet have diagnosable HD. And we were just testing the tolerability of different doses of CoQ. Um, the, the Care HD study used 600 milligrams a day. The True Care study is using 2,400 milligrams a day. But those were both studies in individuals who already have HD. And our concern was people who are working, who don't yet have a disease, may have less ability to tolerate a drug than individuals who are, are um, already affected. Individuals were followed for 20 weeks. And the primary outcome, as I said, was, was purely tolerability. Now, just to, to remind those of you who, who know about it or, or introduce, coenzyme Q10 is a natural substance that's present in every cell in the body. And it's part of the, the what are called the mitochondria, the energy factories of cells. So the idea is that using CoQ would help boost the um, cell's ability to deal with stresses and um, essentially give them energy uh, in, in very simple terms. Another thing we were doing in the study was testing the um, suitability of a blood biomarker. So what I showed you before were all data from brain imaging. And brain imaging is wonderful because we can see exactly what's going on in the brain, but it's, it's um, a complicated procedure. Uh, it, it's fairly expensive. It would be great if we had blood biomarkers, that is, markers of the progression of HD that we could measure in the blood. And one of the main ones that had been proposed in the past was this one called 8-hydroxydeoxyguanosine, or 8-OHDG. Um, the, the chemistry of this doesn't matter. And as, as it turned out, it was not a very usable biomarker. And I'll show that data in a second. But this is thought to be a reflection of the kind of cellular injury that CoQ is supposed to protect from. But as I said, really, the major goal of this study was just to get information on the feasibility of doing trials in this population. And this is our enrollment graph. So we started um, enrolling subjects in March of 2010. And as you can see, we were cooking along at a nice pace initially. I should mention, by the way, that all our sites initially were sites that were also in the predict HD study, and so we knew they had quite a number of people who were um, eligible for the trial. But then we kind of hit a point where they were not at peak, the sites were not as enrolling as rapidly, and so we had to add several sites. And we also adjusted the study. We um, found, I think, that because people are not yet affected by HD, they're working, and it's not so easy for them to come in for a lot of visits to a center. So fortunately, we were able to streamline the study. So not so many in-person visits were necessary. 
So I'm going to just show a little bit of, of the data from the study. Um, the, the first was um, the, the coenzyme Q10. So we were administering coenzyme Q10 three different doses, 600 milligrams a day, 1,200 milligrams, 2,400 milligrams a day. As I mentioned, this was the dose, 600 milligrams, used in the CARE-HD study. This is the dose, 2,400 milligrams a day, being used in the two-care study. We found somewhat to our surprise that while all three doses caused increase in the levels, they were all pretty much equivalent. So what this graph shows is for each of the three groups, the beginning of the study, week zero, 12 weeks into the study, and 20 weeks into the study, for 600 milligrams a day, 1,200 milligrams a day, and 2,400 milligrams a day, everyone has some CoQ in their blood because, as I said, it's a natural substance present in every cell in the body. So everyone had a baseline level of CoQ. Everyone who was taking the drug had their levels increase, but there was not actually a big difference in the amount of the increase with the different doses. So I think what this suggests is that we may not need to give such high doses to CoQ because we get um, reasonable levels with a lower dose. There's a trend for this to give a higher level, but that was not statistically significant. Uh, and I should say, I, I'm not showing the data, but all three of these doses were tolerable. There was some, again, trend for there to be more adverse events, which were mostly things like minor nausea or uh, minor diarrhea in the higher dose. Um, but all subjects, or all of the groups found the, the drug to be tolerable, and, and most of the subjects in the study were able to complete the study on, on their assigned dose. Um, so then I mentioned we were testing this biomarker. I'll just show these data very briefly because it turned out that the biomarker did not respond to CoQ treatment. So here's the same graph, the three different groups with the different doses, the beginning of the study, and then two points during the study, and at no time did the, the 8-OHDG levels change. And furthermore, when we looked, if you'll remember that graph where I showed estimated years to onset versus the biomarker, the um, cardiac volume, and there was a very striking relationship. By contrast with 8-OHDG, this is just a random set of, of dots, so there's no relation between the, the expected years to onset and the 8-OHDG level. So unfortunately, this turns out not to be such a great biomarker, um, but that's why you do clinical trials, because you need to know this kind of thing, and I think what this says is we have to keep looking for other biomarkers, but in the meantime, we can continue to use brain imaging, which has turned out to be so um, powerful and so, so successful. Now, I want to just um, end the discussion of the prequel uh, data with some um, really initial analyses. And I, by the way, I should say um, all the data I'm showing you is still preliminary. The study is completed. The data analysis is completed but we're still writing the manuscript and um, we have not yet submitted it. So this has to be considered um, preliminary. It has not yet undergone peer review and, and, and is not published. And, and this analysis in particular is, is relatively recent and um, still quite preliminary. But what this shows is if you assume that a drug had a certain effect, let's say it slowed the progression by 50%, which would be quite dramatic, um, but just keep that in mind for a minute. And if you did a five-year study, how many people would you need to have if you used people just like prequel? So remember, prequel enrolled anyone who was um, positive for the HD expansion mutation but not yet affected. And what this shows is that using that criterion and looking for a treatment effect to delay the diagnosable onset of HD, we would need 500 and something subjects to study for five years to see this really quite substantial effect. So that's a feasible study, but it's a, um, a quite a large study. It's actually around the size that studies currently being done are, like uh, to care. But then look at if you had a smaller effect, which is more like what the current drugs we're studying are thought to have, you would need a very large number of subjects. So what we wondered is, what if you selected people based on their age and their CAG repeat length so that you could predict that they were likely to have onset relatively soon? And what we did was we just looked at 
the 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 among the, the prequel subjects, the top quartile, that is the quarter of the subjects who were predicted to have onset soonest. If you restricted a study to those subjects, we you can see that you dramatically decrease the number of subjects you need, going from 540 to 170, or going from 2400, which is really an unmanageable number, to 700, which would be 350 in each group, which is quite a manageable number. So I think what this shows is using our experience with prequel, we now know much more about how to design a clinical trial, and I at least would make the suggestion that clinical trials in pre-manifest HD should do some kind of selection like this. And to go back to the, the graph from before, what we're essentially saying is if you were to take everyone who had been tested and was not yet symptomatic, that would be a lot of people who were quite far from their predicted onset. You'd have to wait a long time to see if the drug was having an effect. Whereas if you take the people who are relatively close to their predicted onset, you can do a study with a reasonable number of people and expect to see an effect. And by the way, I'm talking about an effect on either the diagnosis of HD or more importantly, on the clinical, on the functional outcomes, which is what the FDA um, really looks for in, in drug trials is to make sure that there's really a clinical benefit, not just a, um, a neuroimaging effect, though neuroimaging effects, of course, would be very important as well. So I think what I'd like to say is for, from the prequel study, um, we learned a lot about how to do clinical trials in this population. We found that recruitment was slower than we hoped, but we were able to improve it, and we're actually, we have a questionnaire pending now to, to get more information about this. So I think we got some very practical information about how to do a trial. If we want to study CoQ again in the future, we now know that it's tolerable in this population. We now know some more about the dose. Um, maybe makes it harder to choose a dose, but it also may mean that it doesn't matter so much what dose we, we need. We found that this particular biomarker was not useful, um, but we will now look for other biomarkers. The main thing that we found, though, is that clinical trials and pre-manifest HD are feasible and I believe that if we pre-select based on age and CAG repeat length, we can design efficient trials that will be most likely to see a therapeutic benefit. And to highlight what I'm talking about, most clinical trials in HD so far have involved people who are already affected with HD. So here's, let's say we were looking at steroidal volume or some other um, biomarker, some index of what's going on in the brain. People begin to have atrophy, as I showed before, long before we can make the diagnosis of HD. Most trials so far are using people who have already been diagnosed with HD. So even if a treatment is effective, all it's going to do is slow the progression of the disease that's already present. And as you saw, people have already lost a substantial amount of the important brain region. So what we would like to do is do our trials in pre-manifest HD in subjects who are positive for the HDCAG repeat expansion but don't yet have the disease. And in that case, I mean, here's just a, a hypothetical example, again, of a drug that works, but we begin treatment well before the onset rather than after the onset. And you can see that there would be the hope that we could slow the neurobiologic progression and actually delay the onset, maybe even if we had a, an effective enough drug prevent the onset entirely, and that would be my ultimate hope for HD, not just to slow the progression of the disorder, but to actually um, delay or even ultimately prevent the onset, and that would be really um, the kind of personalized preventive medicine that we would love to have for this disease. So I'd be happy to um, answer any questions at this point. Thank you, Chris. That was great. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, type them in now, and we'll ask them to Chris. I'll ask uh, while people hopefully have a chance to maybe type some questions. Uh, Chris, I, I have a few. Um, first off, in terms of the CoQ and the um, 80HDG levels that you saw in the prequel study, um, 
how did those levels, those plasma levels, compare to normal controls? I'm most interested in the 80HDG. Did you see that there was a difference in elevation? Um, yeah, I, it, I just um, briefly noted that in, in the slides. And we did not have a placebo control group. And we didn't have any individuals who did not have a CAG repeat expansion. So, so we, we could, couldn't directly make the comparison of HD to control. What we could do is two things. Look at the effect of CoQ, and this biomarker had been proposed to be responsive to CoQ, and at least in our study it wasn't. And also look and see if it if if the levels varied depending on how far from predicted onset people were. And again, the, the prediction was that it would be, and, and in our hands it wasn't. And I should say that there has uh, been a, a separate parallel study done by, by CHDI and some other investigators, and they found very similar results. And in their case, they did compare HD, or that is CAG expansion, positive to controls, and they did not see a, a difference. So I think the data are suggesting that this particular biomarker is not going to be useful, and we need to continue to look for other biomarkers. Great. Was, was there was it there a reason that you mentioned that one of the mechanisms of action of, of coenzyme Q is to stimulate the mitochondria and maybe boost uh, energy levels such as ATP? Was there a reason that was? And there, there are a lot of evidence, particularly in animal models, that ATP levels are decreased in HD. Was that investigated in any way or thought to be investigated? Um, no, because it's not ATP in the blood that is um, changed. It's ATP in, in neurons. So you would have to do some kind of a biopsy, um, not a brain biopsy, but, but perhaps some kind of other biopsy. And, and that was felt to be a little bit beyond the scope of this particular trial. OK. All right, we have a, a few questions coming in, Chris. One, first one is, um, do you have any specific drugs in mind to begin the next trials? Well, I'll tell you, this is the this is the big problem. We have been studying HD now for 20 years, and um, it's been slow developing drugs. So, as as George mentioned, uh, PD10 inhibition is currently thought to be a good target. So that would be one of them. Um, there are a number of other drugs that are kind of in the pipeline and being studied, and and, and maybe George can, can add to this. I personally believe, though, that the really the dramatic advances with what are called antisense therapies, that is therapies which are directed at the messenger RNA which makes the Huntington protein, have um, really tremendous promise. So this is something that is, is a really quite a new discovery. Anyone who um, saw Holly, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, Holly Kardesh was? Yeah. Um, who gave a talk several months ago um, saw some of the data. The idea is that we're quite sure that m most of, or at least many of the effects of, of the expanded Huntington gene are via the Huntington protein. And all proteins are made via a messenger RNA. And so if we had reagents that could knock down the, the messenger RNA, that would be acting really at the very cause of HD. And there are now several different ways to do that. Unfortunately, you have to deliver these substances directly into the brain, or at least into the cerebrospinal fluid. So these are more invasive kinds of, of therapies than a typical drug therapy. But several different companies are, as well as CHDI and, and other organizations, are working on ways to deliver um, the various kinds of antisense RNA or antisense oligos into the brain to really have a substantial effect on HD. And if these can um, be devised so that they can be delivered safely, I think there's there's now the potential to, to really make a substantial difference for HD. I should also say that, there, like I said, there are a lot of, of, of chemical compounds that could become drugs, um, just as the antisense uh, approach was kind of an unexpected discovery. I think we have a lot of hope that some of these compounds, now that there's so much work going on, will also um, give us some un unanticipated discoveries and some new new approaches. So sorry for such a long answer. It's a kind of a complicated story, but I think we have much more hope for therapeutic advances now than even, say, five years ago. 
Yeah, and I, I would echo that. I mean, I think that everyone's very excited about the, the silencing technologies and the ASOs from ISIS. Uh, they're probably uh, a quite a, uh, some time before we see them tested in HD patients, as, as kind of they kind of alluded to, Holly alluded to in our presentation in March. But um, uh, Chris is right uh, in the reason that I'm inviting Ken Merrick for next month's presentation on PDE10 is that is uh, a drug trial that's actually beginning in, in France now. It's a, a Pfizer drug, that uh, an old drug for schizophrenia, but that uh, Pfizer and another company called Omeros is, is pursuing two separate PDE10 inhibitors for Huntington's disease. So you'll be hearing a lot about it. So these are some trials that will be happening or are happening now. Um, another question, Chris, is um, what proportion of the patient population uh, is in this quote unquote close to onset range? And can you get enough patients to do clinical trials in this group? Right. So these are, I think, some of the questions that people are beginning to ask. It, that, that was one of the reasons for doing prequel. So prequel was open to anyone, and we enrolled 90 subjects, so we kind of took who, who, whoever was interested. And that, I think, is, is representative of those individuals who will be interested in participating in clinical trials. And what we saw was, in, in that table that I showed toward the end, if we just pick the quarter of that population who's closest to onset, we can really substantially improve the efficiency of clinical trials. So that means um, we would be, would be choosing a quarter of the people who would otherwise be eligible. I think that's a manageable number. The other advantage to that is you're saying, in a sense, the other people, well, they're, far, they're so far from onset they don't have to worry, and it's not even worth doing a clinical trial yet. So you're really focusing on the population who both has the most to benefit, but also has the most um, information that we can get from the trial. I, I'm not sure if that answers the question, and, and please re-ask it if, if that wasn't clear. Great. Thanks. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, is it another question, Chris? Is uh, is it possible to work with a prequel type project without having knowledge of our gene status? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So one of the big controversies, or I shouldn't say controversy, but one of the big uncertainties is when and if one should get tested if one is at risk for HD. There have been two studies that have um, kind of taken opposite approaches to that. The PREDICT HD study has looked only at people who are tested and know that they're going to get HD. The FARO study looked at people who knew that they were at risk and wanted to participate in research but had not yet been tested. And it turned out that about two-thirds of them, at least I think it was, were turned out to be negative. So if you take people who are at risk, you have to remember that while it's 50-50 for any individual, if you look at a population, a certain number of people will already be affected. So if you look at the at-risk population, it's actually going to be tilted toward the gene negative. So the disadvantage of doing a clinical trial in that population is really twofold. One is you're exposing a lot of people who turn out to be gene negative to any potential side effects or uh, risks of the drug. And, and two, you, because only a third of the people in the study actually have the HD expansion mutation, you essentially need three times as many people as you would if you used um, only people who had been tested positive for the gene. So this is a topic that there's a lot of discussion about. Um, I think Certainly most drug companies would prefer to do a study where they didn't have to worry that two-thirds of the people were being exposed to the drug and didn't actually have the HD expansion. Um, another way of thinking about it is as therapeutics get closer and closer to being realized, I think that the sort of risk-benefit calculation for being tested will change, and people will start thinking that 
there's more benefit in being tested than maybe there appeared to be in the past. And my my guess would be we'll have more more people who have been tested who are potential subjects in, in future trials. So again, I'm not, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but... Uh, I'm sorry, Chris. I was talking. Yeah. I was on mute. Um, it does answer the question. I, I have another one for you. Yeah. Um, do, uh, from your perspective, uh, there's a question. Would you suggest that HD people take coenzyme Q as a supplement? Right. Um, this is a question I get a lot. And what I have to say is I can't actually recommend it in the sense that I would write a prescription or say um, there's enough evidence to take it because it's, it's under study and the evidence isn't in yet. There were trends for benefit in the CARE-HD study. The two CARE study is still in progress, but um, it hasn't been stopped, and it would have been stopped if it, the drug were shown to be clearly ineffective. So um, I think there's some reason to take CoQ. It's, it's quite safe, um, some minor adverse effects. Um, I think if I were at risk for HD, I would probably take it. Um, so I think it's a reasonable thing to do, but again, there's not enough evidence there for me to actually recommend it or, or prescribe it. Then the, the next question is, if someone is considering taking an experimental medication like CoQ, um, how much should they take? Now, I, I should mention that CoQ is available over the counter. You can get it at, at, at most large um, drug stores. Um, it's now available in fairly high doses because the, the doses that we're using in these studies are much higher than what had been considered before. You can get, I think, 100 milligram or even maybe 200 milligram pill. And it's hard to know exactly what to think about. The, do the range of doses that have been studied are between 600 milligrams a day and 2,400 milligrams a day. We didn't see any big difference in the blood levels um, in our study, but our study is a small study, and, and um, uh, you know other studies may find something different. So I think you could make an argument for taking it anywhere between 600 and 2,400 milligrams a day if you chose to take it. Uh, working on that, we just got a question in saying that if would there be a reason for people who have started to already exhibit the symptoms to take CoQ? Well, yes. Um, as far as we know, the biology of HD is quite consistent. If, if you look, for instance, at those pictures of the striatal atrophy, it's pretty steady over the course of even the period before you can make the diagnosis and after you can make the diagnosis and are affected. We don't know any reason that the biology should, should be different. And so I think if one were to decide to take a drug like CoQ, it would be just as reasonable to take it if you were um, positive for the mutation or, for that matter, if you didn't want to be tested and you were just at risk. Um, and it would be just equally as reasonable to take it if, if you were affected. Again, I, I can't quite recommend it because the evidence isn't in, but I think it's certainly a reasonable thing to do. Okay. Um, there's one quick question. I, I think I can answer this for everyone. Uh, is we were talking about the PDE-10. Uh, the question was, was there a PDN, PDE-10 trial in France for individuals who are pre-manifest? And I'll have to double check, and I can get back to you, but I'm pretty sure that this, these early trials on, are in early manifest HD patients. I'm not sure if you know the answer to that, Chris. I, I think I think that's right, and I think in general, people are figuring that trials will be done in, in people who are manifest first. I, I would like to really um, try and work toward doing trials in pre-manifest individuals as early as possible and as soon as possible because I think that's where the greatest benefit is going to be. Um, you know, so I'm. If, if there's a, a decent drug that has some evidence of effectiveness, I would love to organize another bigger trial really to look for efficacy in pre-manifest HD. Um, we'll have one time for one or two more questions. Um, this is a question from a mother, Chris, and I, hopefully you can uh, follow this. I, my daughter was tested about two years ago and was positive, but she was not told the number of her CAG repeat. 
uh, she was told that the number was not necessarily helpful. It was more helpful to realize that since uh, this came from her father, the gene mutation came from her father, one-third of the affected children would develop symptoms at the same time as their father, while two-thirds would develop symptoms earlier. This study, rely, I guess the prequel study, relies on the CAG repeat. Is, is this something that has changed over time? Yeah, th that, that's, that's a very interesting question. So before we understood the exact significance of the CAG repeat, there was a lot of inclination to say, well, let's not make that part of routine testing because uh, we don't fully understand it. My own view is at this point there's so much evidence about exactly what the CAG repeat means that um, I think people should know their CAG repeats. They can certainly ask for it. We, when we do genetic testing, we always do divulge the, the length of the repeat. It's important to understand that its predictive ability is limited, particularly for adult onset cases. You saw the wide range of variability at the age of onset. On the other hand, there is a substantial difference in the mean age of onset, even, say, between 42 repeats and 45 repeats, which are, are both quite common. And so I, I personally do think it, it's, if you're going to be tested, I, I think it's very reasonable to um, get the information about what the CAG repeat length is and exactly what can or cannot be deduced from that. I hope that answers the question because that's an important question. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, kind of speaking, a question in in regards to predicting motor onset. I was really struck by your statistical analysis, where you uh, were able to kind of uh, when you, your power analysis, where you were able to predict people who were closer to motoric onset, and showing them that you would need fewer, dramatically fewer number of patients. To come to complete yes. a trial with a you know a certain percent uh, effect, whether it was 25 percent or 50 percent effect. Um, in, in your opinion, are the the statistical models that people are using to predict motoric onset in HD good enough, or can we do better? Should we be doing working on that and, and making better predictions to fine tune that that uh, who will be exhibiting yeah. symptoms? Yeah, so very interesting and complex question. Um, I think the, the ability of the CAG to predict, it, 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 we know what that is, and it's highly statistically significant. But as I said, for individuals, particularly for um, adult onset, there's a lot of variability, so it's, it's hard to, to be too certain about it. But for the design of clinical trials, yes, it's, it's a very powerful predictor, and I think makes a big difference. And then I would add the other point that there's quite a bit of, of variability that is explained, that, that looks to be genetic, but is not due to the CAG repeat itself. And so we and a lot of other people now are looking for other modifier genes that don't themselves cause HD, but that can change the age of onset to either make it come later or earlier. And that might help explain why there's so much variability. And if we knew those what those genes were, they would have two benefits. First, they would help in predicting the age of onset, but much more important, because they can modify the age of onset, they would be the ideal therapeutic target because we would know from humans biologically that they could potentially be used to delay the onset. Great. That was great, Chris, and thank you very much. Uh, we're, we're now at 1 o'clock, so I, I recognize people have other things to do or want to go grab some lunch or get on with their day. Uh, so um, thank you, Chris, for joining us and, and, and taking your time out of your busy day and presenting to the families and patients uh, uh, of HDSA. Sure. My pleasure and best wishes to everyone. Thank you so much.